a listener production. It's Rusty here, all set for part two of my podcast with stunt driver, coach and racer Warren Luff. If you haven't already checked out part one, head back to the Garage Library and give it a listen. From roaring up sand dunes in Sydney to meeting the great Ayrton Senna, driving and racing at the daunting, legendary Nürburgring, growing up at Oran Park, working alongside Mark Webber and wowing the crowds at Movie World. But that's only part of his journey. We'll pick up part two by continuing our chat about the Stone Brothers. Now, Warren raced for them in 2005, co-driving for Marcus Ambrose. The Bathurst race was a flashpoint, what fans remember as Balaclavagate, being penalised for allegedly not adhering to rules that mandated the use of them for safety. And of course, Marcus's crash with Greg Murphy, which remains one of the most talked about in history. What you may not know is that Warren had quite a medical battle in the weeks leading up to the great race. So I think it was like probably three weeks out from the race. I went to bed one night, was feeling fine, woke up the next morning and like my throat was on fire. Like I've gone from sort of like going to bed feeling great to woke up feeling like, wow, like felt like a truck had hit me. Like my whole body was run down, my throat was on fire, like I could hardly swallow um, so obviously knowing that we're three weeks out from Bathurst, so I was a little bit kind of like, well, hang on, this isn't good. I better go to the doctor and sort of just get some antibiotics or just like really need to knock this on the head pretty quickly. So I went to the local doctor. He said I had a bit of a look. Oh, yeah, like you, look, you're probably just a bit run down. You probably just need some rest. And I'm like, I don't have time to rest. I need to, <laughs> I need to get this under control. Um, so he gave me some antibiotics and um, basically said, look, go home, rest, drink some water. You'll be fine. Over the following days, like, my health deteriorated massively to the point where, like, I could hardly swallow. I was in so much, like, to try and take painkillers or antibiotics was, like, like a 10-minute sort of, like, build up the courage to try and swallow a tablet. And then, like, literally swallowing a tablet felt like someone was, like, jamming a knife in the side of my throat. Like, I was in so much pain. I I couldn't eat. I was hardly drinking, so I was dehydrated and just... Like I was in a world of pain and and that probably went like that for, I went back to the doctor a couple of days later and he's like, look, no, there's nothing more. The antibiotics should start to work. It's just an infection. You're just going to have to ride it out. So I was starting to panic a little bit because obviously for me at that point in my career, this was the biggest opportunity. Like Marcus was coming into the 05 season as the as a double champion. Obviously he'd made the announcement earlier that year that he was leaving to go to NASCAR the following year and there'd been a lot of, on track angst uh, that year already between obviously Marcus and uh, Scafi and Murph. And so there was a huge amount of pressure and expectation going into Bathurst. So as my health kept deteriorating, uh, eventually it got to a point where, so where I was living, Brian Lawrence, who was the commercial manager at the time of Stone Brothers, was a great, great friend of mine and, um, and someone that was very instrumental right throughout my career. I rang Brian this day and I'm like, could hardly talk on the phone and basically said, hey, you need to come to my place. And he's like, come in and take one look at me. And I was just white. Um, as I said, I'd hardly eaten anything all week. And he's then gone quick, get in the car. So he took me down to a, another doctor down the road, Dr. Bill, who previous to Dr. Carl, who's our current VH supercar doctor, Dr. Bill was the Dr. Carl of the time. Um, so Bill's taken one look at me, took one look at my throat and pretty much all the back of my throat had almost completely clothed over. Like I was having trouble breathing and he's gone, mate, he said, we need to get you in. So he's rung a, a mate of his who was a ear, nose and throat specialist and it's like, basically like get to hospital now, they're waiting there for you. And so what, a, what it was, was a, uh, an infection in the back of my throat and it was a abscess basically formed between the muscle and the tonsils. And so it was basically just closing the back of my throat in. So when I got to hospital, Sugar. so this is about like now day five. And I think by this stage I'd lost about four kilos because of basically just not eating or drinking all week. So not ideal Bathurst prep. Um, so we're nearly two weeks out from Bathurst now. So gone in there, the doctor's taken one look at me and he's like even sort of like rolled his eyes and he's like, wow, this is not good. And so he's like, all right, we can fix this. So I remember just sitting there in the chair and at that point in time, I'm like, you know what, just whatever you've got to do. Like I was in so much pain. I was tired because I hadn't been sleeping. I was hungry. I was thirsty. Like 
So they've plugged me into an IV to sort of try and get some fluids back into me. And he's come at me, I remember just, and I don't like needles like most people. And I remember they've come at me with this needle and like the needle was like this long because what they needed to basically do was put a needle into the back of my throat so go through the mouth. Like a horse, like a horse needle, mate. (laughs) And and I I remember just laying there, I'm like, whatever, I just don't care anymore. And so they had to anaesthetise the back of my throat and then basically came at me with a scalpel and pretty much all just reached in and sliced the back of my throat to relieve the pressure in the back of the throat to to drain the, the abscess that was on both sides. And I remember the nurse, like she's there with the suction and when like he's like sliced it, she, even the nurse is like, oh, my God, just with the amount of um, amount of stuff that came out of both sides. So um, after that, they've sort of like, they've sort of kept me there for a while and they're like, look, there's not much more we can do now. You've just got to go home and rest and it'll start to heal and everything like that. So I, I don't know, I'd been in a hospital for probably half a day at that point in time. I've gone home, gone to bed and just, I was just exhausted and they'd doped me up on some pretty heavy painkillers and um so I'd actually managed to get some sleep and I, don't know, I woke up after like two or three hours or something like that and I remember just like waking up on the pillow and my eyes just looking at my pillow and there was just blood everywhere all over the pillow because the back of my throat had started to hemorrhage and just like blood was like coming out quite sort of quite heavily. So I've rung Brian again. He's got me back to hospital and um, so I think I spent three days then in hospital um, because also the infection had gone into my bloodstream. Um, so I was, I was in a pretty bad way. So now we're probably about a week and a half out when I got discharged from hospital. We're about a week and a half out from uh, Bathurst. I was on all sorts of medication and everything like that. Um, again, like I think I was still like four and a half kilos down overall on my body weight. So and just exhausted beyond comprehension. Like I was still... I was still probably sleeping 13, 14 hours a night. Like I just had no wow. energy. Um, and because of all the medication that obviously I'd been on to try and sort of fight the infection in my system and everything like that, the one thing I was very, very conscious about was the whole drugs in sport thing. Obviously, we are subject to random drug testing and everything like that. So I'd obviously been talking to the doctors about, okay, I've got this race coming up. It's the biggest race. Like I've got a what do I need to do with my medication and that? And basically what they said was, so the Sunday before Bathurst, stop your medication then. Um, everything that you're on will only stay in your system for a maximum of, of up to 48 hours. So they said realistically by Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday morning, whatever's in your system will be out. And I was like, okay, cool. And I had letters from specialists and doctors and everything like that. So I got to Bathurst and one of the first things that I did on the Wednesday was uh, was with Ken Douglas, who was um, obviously very one of the senior engineers there at the time, Ken and I, we've gone down to to go see the medics at the track at the time and the, and the circuit doctor. And I basically explained, look, this is what's happened over the last uh, two and a half weeks. Here's the letters from the hospital. Here's my specialist letter. This is what medication I was on. This is when I've stopped, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I remember, so this is like Wednesday afternoon. And I remember the doctor looking at the letter and he was like, yep, that's fine. He said, but he, and he said, they're right. Everything that you've taken will be out of your system or should be out of your system within a 48-hour window. But if there was anything to stay in your system, you could test positive for any number of these medications that you've been on. And even though you've got these letters to sort of like, you would have a very good case to argue, well, I was on these for these particular reasons. He said, you could test positive for any of these. So at that point, alarm bells have gone off everywhere. Ross, Jimmy and Ken sat down and obviously with Marcus still leading the championship at that point in time, they didn't want to take any risks. So the decision was made to that Wednesday afternoon. They're like, you need to start ringing around and find a doctor here in Bathurst that can do a drugs test just so that we know that you're clear. And I'm like, okay. So I've gone back to the motel, ringing around and every doctor in Bathurst is like, yeah, yeah, cool. We can, yeah, come in. We'll um, we'll do all the necessary tests. We'll have the results for you early next week. And I'm like, no. <laughs> I, 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 I kind of need them sort of by tomorrow lunchtime. And they're like, oh, look, that's that can't happen. We've got to send, send pathology away. So I ended up ringing a really good friend of mine in Sydney who, when I lived in Sydney, he used to be my CAMS medical officer. And I remember talking to Peter and I was like, hey, this is what's going on and I need to do a drugs test. He goes, look, read me all the letters that you've got. So I read him everything from the specialists. And he's like, mate, don't worry about it. He said, there won't be anything in your system now, let alone by Sunday. He said, like, you're fine. And I said, I know that. 
but I need the team need me to do this. So I think it was like seven o'clock now on the Wednesday night. And so he said to me, he said, look, he said, if you can get back to Sydney, he said, I can, we can, we can rush it through. And he said, I'll have the results for you like pretty quickly. And I'm like, so can I come back to Sydney tonight? And he was like, look, he said, if you come back to Sydney tonight, I'll get one of the nurses to meet you at the clinic. He said, so you, you let me know when you're nearly there. I'll get one of the nurses to come and meet you at the clinic. We'll do the paperwork. We'll do the urine sample. We'll do everything that you need. And he said, I'll have the results for you by lunchtime tomorrow. He said, but mate, I'm telling you now, you'll be fine. I'm like, well, I need to. So I rang Ken and uh, and he said, mate, get in your car and get to Sydney. <laughs> so at like seven o'clock Wednesday, and that was also, I was still doing the um, development series race for that that weekend for Paul Crookshank Racing. So I'd done the whole um, development series that year with uh, Paul Crookshank with Decina on board. So not only was I driving with Marcus, but I was also doing um, the development series. So again, just my physical state, I really wasn't probably as well prepared as what I should be. So I've Wednesday night, I've driven all the way back to Sydney, went to the clinic, had one of the nurses meet me there, did the sample, did the paperwork. She's like, yep, cool, we'll ring you tomorrow. Drove back to Bathurst. So I got back to Bathurst at like my half past one, two o'clock in the morning, I think it was, and just beyond tired. This is like, race I remember, week, mate. This is, this this is, is race like week. the night before <laughs> practice starts. My God. So, um, yeah, like I remember driving through the Blue Mountains. I've got the windows down in the car. I've got the radio on blaring flat out, just trying to sort of just stay alert because I was just, just that tired and beyond exhausted. But um, got back. We got the test results the next day. And obviously, um, as everyone had said, I was all in the clear. So um, we got the thumbs up. And, um, and yeah, so we, we continued on with the race weekend. But, um, look, as we know, what transpired in the race, there was the, the drama with both Marcus and I with the balaclava. But look, mine was probably taken more out of a case of I knew I needed to do a double stint. And again, a double stint back then was probably closer to 30 laps for a single stint. Mm -hmm. So you're talking like nearly 60 odd laps um, for a double stint back then, which these days is, is closer to a triple stint with what the fuel economy is today. But again, back then, there's no cool suit, there's no helmet fans, there's nothing. So temperature in the cars you're talking sort of like mid-50s in the car. So to do sort of a double stint back then was was rather taxing on the body at the best of times, let alone when you haven't had what you'd call probably ideal preparation coming in. So, um, yeah, look, obviously to this day it's probably a, a decision that I'll uh, eternally regret um, and we saw obviously what happened. But the, I suppose probably the most disappointing thing for both Marcus and I was that the drive-through penalty for me for not having the balaclava on him having to come in and put the balaclava on for that sort of unscheduled stop, the the incident with Murph was actually the pass for third. So um, look, it's one of those races. What what could have been on balance? Mate? Yeah, mm. look, I, look. I, to be honest, I don't know if we probably had the ultimate speed to match Scaife that day. They uh, they were really fast. Um, but uh, look, it certainly you probably look at it and you go, you'd like to think that we're definitely on for a podium finish. Um, certainly the way that Marcus was driving at that point, he was, uh, he was rather angry and fired up. And as, we, as we've seen, the, the rest is obviously history. There was that great sort of uh, altercation on the side of the track where I'm pretty sure they were just complimenting each other about their driving skill and uh, wishing each other best for the, for the rest of the weekend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> like Stone Brothers, you've had, in an endurance sense, the chance to drive for some big teams, mate, and done a remarkable job for them along the way. But there are a couple of full-time stints in supercars that we should we should point out too for, for DJR, for Lucas Dumbrell Motorsport, for, for Brytech. And while overall the, the results mightn't be there, I think that the nice way to compartmentalise this is you got to do some good things like working with Jason Bright, who at the time you learned a lot from and, and rate as a result quite highly, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I raced full-time for Brightech in uh, 06, uh, which was their second year in the championship. So Brighty was still at um, at ProDrive at that point in time, sort of spearheading sort of their, their factory effort, uh, and then stayed on board to do the endurance races in 07 uh, in the second car with Alan Gurr, uh, and that was the first year of Brighty coming on and driving for his team. But even in that first year at Brightech in 06, to have someone of Jason's experience, um, and still to this day, I rate Jason as probably uh, one of the smartest guys in terms of his ability to to feel what a car is doing. To he, he's got such a good engineering brain. Uh, like I honestly think if he if he hadn't have been such a successful race car driver, he would have made an exceptional race engineer because his his understanding and and knowing what a car needs to get the best out of it from both a driving and an engineering point. 
Um, and he's one of those guys that I really learned a huge amount from in those early sort of years of my career. So, um, yeah, like like you said, sort of the the three full-time years that I had probably didn't sort of yield the results that I ultimately would have liked. But out of those came opportunities to go and do other things and, and everything like that. So um, there's certainly no regrets. Um, and certainly like after my final sort of full-time year in uh, 2011 with Lucas D'Umbrell, came the opportunity to partner with Craig for those two fantastic years at Triple Eight. So again, without sort of that opportunity of being at Lucas's in 2011, uh, I mightn't have got the opportunity to, to go to Triple Eight and work alongside Craig and and all those fantastic people that were there at the time. So um, you can never you can never look back with too much regret throughout your career because out of out of those uh, out of those times came opportunities to go and do other things. Lots of stuff leads to to things, doesn't it? In that in that sense, that's a seriously cool period. You, Craig Lowndes, Triple Eight together. We'll talk some of the results and and cars in a moment. But what's it like behind the scenes there? Jamie seems like the inch perfect guy. Craig's the the kind of modern day Peter Brock who loves doing things. I, I mean, I I heard stories of of Craig. You know, if Jamie had a, a special muesli in the truck put away in a certain place. Craig would deliberately put it somewhere else. It's, does stuff like that go on? Yeah, absolutely. Look, look, Craig's that guy <laughs> that he will just – probably one of the greatest things I learned from Craig is that you're not always going to have the car perfect. You're not always going to to have that car that's maybe capable of winning, but it's about doing the best you can. And, and Craig is, is well known for his ability to get the best out of whatever you give him. Give him a race-winning car and he will deliver every time. Give him a car that's – probably not a race winning car but it's it's only a top 10 car he will grab every last ounce of effort out of that car and he will make it do things that probably it shouldn't really be capable of doing so he, that that innate ability just to drive around any particular problem to first of all drive it in a way to identify what the weakness of the car is but then his ability to to tune his driving to get every bit of performance that he can out of that car you know that at the end of the day with Craig, whatever the result of that car, that's the best it was ever going to do. So he's he's just the consummate master in that. And as you said, like he's the people's champion. He's that, and a lot of people, probably one of the most common questions that I've been asked right throughout my career is, what's Craig Lowndes like away from the track? And it's like what you see on TV, that likeable, fun-loving, down-to-earth, approachable guy that he is on TV, that's exactly who he is away from the track. He's just... He's just, he's so likable, he's so lovable. And for me, I look at my career and and guys like Craig and I look at it and I go, you know what, I was so lucky that that I started out as a fan. Uh, I got to race against him as a competitor. Uh, I got to be a teammate with him. But most importantly now, I consider him a great friend and a, and a really good mate and someone that I look forward to being able to see when I go to the track and catch up and just to talk about not, not necessarily motorsport but just we talk about life and and have a few laughs along the way and everything like that. So um, yeah, he's a he's an awesome guy. In that role as co-driver, you, you've got to be adaptable, don't you? You sometimes there's there's limited laps in the build up to a to a Bathurst. You you've got longevity in this role, and I'm intrigued about what the secret to your success is. In the sense that is it the investment you make along the way during the year and getting to know the team, the structure, the way they operate, and and so on and fitting in when you sometimes do have that limited amount of, of, of wheel time. Yeah, look, I think as a co-driver, your role is to to fit in and around the team, whoever it is that you partner with and, and everything like that. And you're there to to support them because in any endurance race, the, the main guy, they're going to do the bulk of the driving in the car. So it's your role to, to support them both in and out of the car. Like it's um, to to help them in whatever you can out of the car um, and and certainly be that guy that can get in and do the job. It's not your job to win the race. It's your job to, to get in there and do the best job you can. Ultimately, if you're in a position that you can move forward through the field, then obviously do that. Certainly try not to lose too many spots, but the most important thing is you've got to bring it back in one piece. There's there's no good. It's not about out there trying to be sort of the hero to to make all the sort of dive bomb moves and and, and be that guy that everyone's everyone's talking about after the race to sort of go, oh wow, didn't he do a fantastic job? But 
on the other side, don't be that guy that they're also talking about where they go, God, didn't he do a bad job out there or didn't he make some dumb mistakes out there? And it's it's a, such a fine line between the two. Um, and look, certainly over the years, I've also been very lucky to be partnered with some amazing guys that have been in a position at the end of the race to be able to deliver and get us to the podium. As I say to people, my job is to do that sort of that lunchtime shift and 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 keep us in contention. But it's that guy at the end of the car. It's his job to race for the podium. It's his it's up to him and the team to ultimately get us in that position where we can stand on the podium at the end of the day. You talked about the Bathurst podium before. There's a Sandown 500 wins. The Enduro Cup, which was a you know a very special part of, of supercars, the combination of, of, of Sandown, Bathurst and Gold Coast together. And, and you've had success. You know, you hold a special place in the record books with with that. Is, is there one somewhere there that you sort of look back and you go, that moment on that podium I really savour? Look, I think probably 2012, that first Bathurst podium with Craig, um, for two reasons. As a kid growing up as a fan of the sport and watching Bathurst, like in in our household, Bathurst was that sort of, that was that religion of where nothing else happened in our house. Unfortunately for my sister, her bath her her her, her, her birthday <laughs> happens to fall back then on that on that Bathurst long weekend. So unfortunately, in our household, it was Bathurst and then uh, Vicky's birthday. Uh, but thankfully, <laughs> thankfully, she's a great motorsport fan as well. Um, but yeah, so to to have that realization of the dream of that kid that wanted to go racing to not only go racing to now be racing a Bathurst to then to walk out onto that podium. And to walk out on that podium the first time as as Craig Lowndes' teammate, uh, it's a it's a pretty special moment, um, and that's probably the one that I savour the most. But obviously, there's been there's been a, f- a few other podiums over the years, and and you appreciate them all for different reasons. Like last year, I think last year's podium was so special because of everything that we went through with COVID, and obviously still going through to this day. And it was probably the most surreal moment because to walk out on the podium with so few people down there watching, it's basically like your teams and a handful of people down there. It made it it made it made probably even more special in that, like as I said, Bathurst is, is a religion for so many people. There was people uh, last year, it was their first time not going to Bathurst in 30 or 40 years or whatever. There's people that have got their own Bathurst stories that that they book their family holidays around and it's they've got that campsite that they always go to. So for us to still be able to go there and do what's so special to us and those people miss out, I think walking out on the podium to not see those people down there, it made it probably that special in a different way in that we still got to do what we do, but they unfortunately had to miss out on what was so special to them. Um, so hopefully this year we can get back to to decent crowds and uh, and those people that are so much part of the Bathurst religion and the Bathurst institution can be can be back there doing what they love. Well done, mate. Great perspective on it all. Uh, quickly, Garth Tander says I should stir you about your hair and ridiculous hands. Do you want to return serve? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Garth's one of those great guys where, um, yeah, look, he and I have had some great banter over the years and, and another a great mate. Like, obviously, we had some great fun times together in sort of our, our, our three years together. Um, we had a Sandown 500 victory together, the Pertec Enduro Cup. Um, obviously, Bathurst 2014 didn't quite go to plan when I had the brake failure in uh, in practice there, and uh, which put us out for the weekend. And um, But, look, Garth's a... Garth's a great mate, and um, there's plenty of things that I could say probably in retaliation, but <laughs> I'll uh, I'll leave that for another conversation because I don't want to incriminate either of us. But um, again, uh, similar to similar to Bridie, Jace, uh, Garth's one of those guys that I learnt so much from, and I've got a huge amount of respect for both in and out of the car. And again, another guy that if he wasn't so goddamn good behind the wheel, or these days behind the microphone, he could have very easily been a, an incredibly successful race engineer. Because again, one of those. One of those guys that just has unbelievable feel for not only what the car is doing, but also what he needs and his ability to to communicate it. So, um, yeah, he was a uh, he was an instrumental guy certainly in my career and still a still a great mate. I'm glad you say that because I think he's doing a a super job and and offering a, a level of currency uh, by sharing some of those those insights that you, that you talk about. It leads me to Walkinshaw, Andretti, Andretti United again. You're there this year. 
is there a sense of you know in your mind how much longer can I can I keep doing it? We've talked about Brock Feeney and a few others because of the the younger people coming through, but you still love it. And every year, uh, uh, incredibly, mate, you w- when you're in that that endurance position, you just you just revel. You do it so well. Yeah, look, look, I I, I love Bathurst, and and uh, like I said, I love driving cars and love getting the most out of myself and the car and and everything. And so for me, the obviously the the relationship with the team started in 2014, and um, obviously been through a few different sort of teammates over the year, and obviously lucky to be partnering with Bryce this year. So. Would love nothing more than to to stand on that podium again with Bryce and uh, and obviously sort of share that moment with him. But it's um look they've become like family to me. As I said to Ryan, I'd still love to try and go for at least a few more years because if I can do a few more years, then I'll get long service leave in a, in a couple more years out of Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> but um look at at the end of the day, as I've said to so many people that um that motorsports like a like a merry go round. At some point in time you're lucky enough that you get on and at some point in time the merry-go-round stops and it's your turn to get off and um and and certainly at some point in the in the future it'll be my turn to get off um but I'll always look back at the at my time in the sport uh and what I've done and what I've achieved and and the opportunities and everything like that and and be very very grateful for it you can't be you can't be sort of um too sort of disappointed or hold any grudges when you sort of look back and and look at what I've done because as I said there was a there was a seven-year-old kid that used to watch motorsport on TV that dreamt of being a race car driver one day, and he sits here before you to this day, a few years down the track, and uh, and still getting to do it. So it's a, it's a. I, I look at it um, with what I'm doing these days as a very privileged position. I'm very lucky to to do what I do, and uh, and I love I love the opportunity that I that I still have at Walkinshaw Andretti United, and and hopefully there'll be a, a few more years to come. Is there one supercar in the almost 20 years of, of having steered them where you feel a, an affinity, a connection? Maybe it's one of the ones with Lowndes. Was there one with the, when you drove it, you sort of... And, and, and perhaps sometimes these questions are more results orientated than anything else because you picked up a, a trophy that day or a podium or whatever it was. But but just in that moment where the car, the team, everything, the moment, it just, it just you know felt like a, a car that you have a fond memory of. I think Sandown 2016 with Garth. Um, it had been a pretty tough year up to up to that point, um, and so the team made the decision to to put a new chassis into the championship for Garth. Um, and like the first test day that we did at um, at Winton, I remember we were both really happy with the improvements that we'd made with the new car, um, and we got to Sandown and like straight from the moment we rolled it out of the truck, like in practice one, we were both kind of like, at the, I remember at the end of uh, Friday practice, we were both kind of just talking with each other and we're like, we're looking really good. Like everything that we did through practice, every change that we made, it just kept, the car kept getting better and better. Um, and it just, it gave you that sense of confidence and um, the the Saturday, the sort of the, the two sprint races that we obviously had to do on the Saturday, we went well. Uh, we started on the front row come Sunday and it was just, it was one of those weekends where just everything went right. The team did an amazing job. Um, strategy was spot on. But then we had that moment late in the race where the front guard sort of peeled off, the front left guard peeled off and was sort of hanging off the car. And um, like, I think Garth had like about a 14 second lead or something like that over SVG. And then there was that panic of, first of all, are they going to, are they going to black flag us to come in and repair it? Um, but it, it altered the the um, the handling of the car massively because you had this front guard flapping out in the breeze, so it made it really nervous under brakes. Turned in exceptionally well on left hand corners, but, <laughs> but it, it, it really sort of unsettled the rear of the car. And um, and so Shane started to sort of chip away, chip away. And obviously those guys would have been on the radio going, "Hey, these guys got a problem." Let's so like that last portion of the race, and I think probably. Something that did go in our favour was that the um, the time certain finish came, came into effect. So we didn't do the full 161 laps, um, and obviously, look, we managed to get over the over the line and uh, and win the race. So it was a it was an amazing um, amazing feeling because, um, as I said, like with 20 odd laps to go and a 14 second lead, you sort of you're quite confident. And then the the front guard happened, but yeah, that car that weekend, all weekend, was just. It was spot on from the moment we rolled out of the truck and it was just one of those times where 
Um, you've really got a lot of confidence in the car and the way that it progressed through the weekend and ultimately to to then have it sort of repay not only us but obviously the team, our fans, our, sp- our sponsors, supporters and everyone like that was a, was a great weekend. That's a good choice. Um, I, I recall that race vividly, mate, so I'm not surprised that it's had that, that effect on you. My dad used to start our old Gemini with a sledgehammer all the time. Gives a whole new meaning to the word jump start. It's a question I don't often like to ask. Is there a crash was? And and I ask that because <laughs> the reason I ask that is that I actually don't recall many with you across the time of, of your career. But is there one that you sometimes think back on and maybe it makes you wince a little bit or something like that? Uh, Bathurst 2014 practice, um, Saturday morning practice. Um, it was a co-driver session and um, obviously I'd already done three or four laps. We came in, uh, made a made a suspension adjustment to the front end. Uh, the boys have pushed me back out. I had a brake pedal in pit lane, was going up pit lane, tapped the brakes to check. Uh, a lot of people naturally assumed because of the, the accident and having just sort of come out of the pits that are dumb race car driver that just changed the pads and hadn't pumped up the pedal, but that wasn't the case at all. Uh, it was actually a, a front brake line failure. Um, so th- th- the worst thing was I had the brakes in pit lane um, and they hadn't even touched the brakes. But um, So when I came out of the pits, our our race engineer was on the radio and he was literally on the radio and he said, look, um, Lounge, he's just coming through turn one, let him go. You've got some clear track behind. So even when I first came out of the pits, I probably didn't accelerate as hard as what I could have because I've seen Craig go by and I left a bit of a gap and then I slowly built up to speed. Went up mountain straight and um, went for the brakes and literally the pedal went straight to the floor and um, madly managed to try and pump it to get some kind of a pedal, but it had actually blown the um, the line off the front left caliper. So um, all I ended up with was, uh, was a bit of rear and managed to sort of punch it down a few gears, which kind of started to get the car sliding and then obviously hitting Craig, um, not only unfortunately put him into the into the wall, but probably thankfully for me, it sent me in there backwards. So the inertia and the impact for me was sort of only pushing me back into the seat, which ultimately it didn't actually really hurt that much. It was just probably more the fright of it. And then obviously up in the air and ended up on its side. And then obviously there's the the great pictures of Craig helping me out of the car and us having a bit of a bromance hug on the on the side of a track there. So that was kind of one of those really tough weekends because not only in that race, but also I was doing Carrera Cup for McElroy Racing at the time. Uh, on the Friday, I'd unfortunately made a mistake over the top of the mountain and had a had a decent sort of shunt in the in the Carrera Cup car. Um, the boys had done an all nighter on Friday night um, repairing the car, and then I've obviously had the shunt in the supercar. But thankfully, medical cleared me, and I was all all good to go. And it was probably like it was an hour, maybe an hour and a half later, I had qualifying for Carrera Cup. Uh, and still managed to stick it on the front row in second position. And um, the the races went quite well. But the final race on the Sunday morning in Carrera Cup, there'd been a – we were leading. Um, there'd been an incident somewhere on the track and we're under safety car. And in my head, I'm like, let's just finish this. It's It's been a tough weekend. We're currently leading. Like, let's just – let's just put the flag out and let's be done with it. And then they come on the radio and they're like, yep, safety car's in this lap and it's a one-lap sprint to the finish line. So I've sort of like, all right, let's do this and um, got a good run on, on the restart, good run through, through turn one and then going up to turn two, uh, someone back in fourth or fifth has kind of made a move on someone and gone down the inside, dropped a wheel on the grass and basically came through and, and skilled a whole bunch of us. So took out myself and Richo, um, Dave Russell, um, and I basically ended up backwards into the same tire wall that on Saturday oh. morning with Craig, I'd, I'd been upside down. So it was a, it was probably more of a, a mentally exhausting weekend that one, because there'd been so much, um, so much going on, obviously the, the accident on Friday, which was a hundred percent my fault. Um, then obviously the, the, the issue on, uh, on Saturday where, which put us out for the weekend and obviously put Craig into the wall, which I felt terrible about. And then to sort of come back and be ultimately leading the final final race of Carrera Cup for that weekend. And had we finished the race in first, we would have won the weekend overall. But to then end up backwards in the po- into the fence and a, another trip to the medical centre, it was my third trip there for the weekend, I think both um, myself and the medical team were sick and tired of seeing each other. 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was definitely a, a a very challenging weekend for for so many different reasons. But um, look, it's one of those things that's um, out of those particular weekends, you you become you become mentally tougher. You become a lot smarter out of out of situations like that as well, and um, you you live to sort of fight on. And mate, importantly, the pictures um, were were of great mateship um, the in the aftermath of that with you and with with you and Craig. There are podiums in the Bathurst 12-hour, trophies from the the 24-hour too. I want to touch back on the GT car for a moment because earlier in the podcast you talked about that two-minute, one-second lap, McLaren 650S. To get the chance to drive that, to roar around the mountain in it, to no doubt pull the, 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 the straps tight, maybe even hold your breath. What is a lap like that in a car like that with what it demands of you, how it excites you? What is that like? That was um, still to this day. That's probably the one of the most unbelievable laps for me from a driver's perspective. Because, as I said, that was when we had a like you had a special qualifying tyre, so it was only good for a couple of laps. The thing was fueled to to literally only do the one lap. Unfortunately, it was the first time I'd also driven on that tyre. So even on your outlap warming up, you can feel that it's got more grip, but you don't want to take too much out of the tyre. So you'd basically, for me, it was a little bit flying blind on that particular lap because you just didn't know where the actual grip of it was. But I remember all the way over the top of the mountain, the speed that you could carry was just unbelievable. Like I remember coming onto Conrad Strait and taking like this massive breath because I pretty much don't think I uh, managed to breathe between the cutting and forest elbow because it was just (laughs) the the speed. And like remembering like a GT car, like up mountain straight and down Conrad, it's about 15K an hour slower than a V8 supercar. And yet we were doing a, as I said, a two hundred one point eight something in qualifying, um, which across is across like, the top. Then, so it, it, your lap speed is all across the top, and obviously, obviously, braking and that as well. But it's just, it was unbelievable the amount of grip that you had. A, a, but all the way over the top, it's sort of like in the back of my head, I was kind of like, oh, I could have gone a bit more. I could have gone a bit more, um, just not knowing ultimately where the overall grip is. And I remember sort of coming over the start finish line and, and seeing a, a two hundred one eight sort of flash up on the on the dashboard. I don't think even if it was even if it was fueled to do a second lap, I don't reckon I could have actually done a second lap. I think I was just so <laughs> mentally drained and exhausted. I'm like, all right, I need to go sit down now and just sort of uh, take a couple of minutes just to have Process just that. to <laughs> recap what actually went on. So that was a very very cool moment uh, in my career to to have that opportunity um, to drive not only a, a car like that, but in in a situation like that with a with a with a quality spec tire uh, and to be able to do such a quick lap around the mountain was pretty special. Can we just spend a moment or two zeroing in on one very cool car that I think will appeal um, to our, our listeners of the podcast, and that is the car that is affectionately known as Nemo. Won the 2012 World Time Attack, which is an amazing event at Sydney Motorsport Park. Tell people about that car, what it is like to drive, and a bit about World Time Attack. So World Time Attack, it's it's, it's one of those unique things in in world motorsport where every category these days is so heavenly governed by rules and regulations of what you can and can't do and and trying to have parity and everything like that. I suppose Time Attack takes the conventional rule book and throws it out the window to the point where it's pretty much all if you can imagine it and if you can build it, you can almost run it. There are obviously there are there are rules along the way for for safety and everything like that. Um, but you're talking like these days. You're talking cars with well over a thousand horsepower, l- levels of levels of aero and downforce that are that are likened to a to an open wheeler or F1 car just about. So uh, the speeds that these cars are capable of. But we when we go back to 2012, uh, a lot of the cars in World Time Attack were still very much a, uh, an improvement on a road car. Like they, they were a road car that had obviously had a huge amount of development done, but still some big wings. I suppose Nemo was probably one of the very first ground up builds where it was take the rule book as it is now. It wasn't a car that's developed over the previous two or three years. So it really, I suppose, set the tune for so many of the cars that we see now in World Time Attack. And for me, the opportunity to to drive that car, it came about really late. So the guy that owned the car had had a few other people working on it and basically came to McElroy Racing only months prior to World Time Attack with a with a half finished car and a whole bunch of parts basically like hey can you can you finish this car off and his plan was to drive it himself um the first test day that we went to Queensland Raceway I pretty much all just went along to 
basically help him and do a bit of driver coaching and, and have a little bit of a drive. And I think very quickly he realised that the the performance level or the potential of this car was certainly a fair way beyond where his, I suppose, experience was. Um, so even when we, th- so the decision was made for me then to go with him down to World Time Attack to again help him, but maybe be on standby in case he really, because he he'd invested a lot in the project and he wanted to see the car do well. Um, and at that point he was like, look, if I can't get the best out of the car, I want you to drive it and let's see what we can do. So we got down there. I hadn't really spent much time in the, in the driver's seat of this car, but, um, but very quickly, um, he made the decision that, look, I'm not going to be able to get the best out of this. I want you to drive. Um, and yeah, like it was, it was an amazing car to drive. It certainly didn't have the most horsepower out there. Like in, in fact, like I think, uh, top speed down the front straight at, Sydney Motorsport Park was just over the 260 mark, which for most cars is not that fast when like the car that finished second to us uh, with Garth Walden driving the Tilton car was somewhere in sort of the, the low to mid 290 range. Um, so ho- wow. we, we were a long way off in terms of horsepower, but we really sort of took the the aero side of it and took it to a whole new level of both over the, o- over the body aero and also uh, underbody aero as well. And um, the car just ran faultlessly all, all weekend and we just kept improving. And we ended up punching out like a, a low one minute 25. And when you consider Oof. the previous year, I think the winning time had been like a, a high 127 or a low 128. Um, and even even that year in 2012, the car, which was uh, the Garth Walden finished second, I think they were still in a in a high one minute 27. So we've really sort of um, not, not only sort of dominated the field that year, but as I said, it really probably set the benchmark for for what a competitive time attack car needed to be. Uh, and when you look at it, like supercars at the time, we're still only sort of in the, because they hadn't run the soft tyre in those days at Sydney Motorsport Park, like a, a quick supercar time was only in a one minute 30. So to be nearly five seconds Massive. quicker than a V8 supercar, mm. uh, but again, it didn't have a huge amount of straight line speed. So it was a really cool project to be a part of. We went back the following year, but unfortunately we had some uh, some engine dramas through practice. So we never really got to sort of turn turn a wheel in anger for the duration of that weekend. And uh, and then after that, unfortunately, the car sort of uh, got parked and uh, hasn't been seen since. But it was it was a great uh, opportunity to be involved in something so cool. And and still to this day, World Time Attack is a is a is a massively successful thing. I take my hats off to Ian Baker, who's behind it. It's his brainchild. He started, I think, in two thousand and eight at Oran Park, and the event has just grown and grown and grown to the point where, like, you got guys coming out from Europe and Asia and America to bring some some of these amazing cars out to to want to play on our on our stage out here. Uh, it's got a huge following, mate. It's a great thing. Just because this is an audio experience, as we wrap up the the conversation on Nemo, I just want you to take people there in the sense of. Uh, body shape, horsepower, um, uh, power plant. What? Just, just describe it if you can, and what, and what it was like to manhandle with all of that, that work that went on in relation to the the ground up build and the focus on the aero that you spoke of. So it was a. It started life as a as a Mitsubishi Evo, um, but realistically, it's. Its resemblance to a Mitsubishi Evo starts and stops with the name because it's, as I said, the the aero was all designed um, by a pro- proper aerodynamicist. Uh, he came on board and and completely did sort of the aero um, using CFD and all sorts of stuff that is now common uh, amongst sort of uh, time attack users and everything like that, but um, had these massive wings on both the front and, and rear because the ultimate thing to, to generate lap time is downforce. Because remembering also in, in world time attack, we don't run a slick tyre, it's, it's an R-spec tyre, but again, in those days, it was a very a very special kind of a tyre because, again, it was a tyre that was good for one or two laps. And I remember even like on our final run when we did the the low one minute 25, coming onto the front straight at Sydney Motorsport Park through that double sort of left-hander, it sounded like like a shotgun going off under the front wheel arch because what it was actually doing, the tyre had already started to blister and it was blowing chunks of rubber out of the out of the front right hand tie on the on the edge and just punching it up into the into the carbon inner guards because the level of downforce it's just squashing this tire so you've got massive wings both front and rear full diffuser under the car 
as I said, in terms of horsepower, we barely had over 500 horsepower in this car. So when you look at the cars of today that are out there that are that are uh, dominating in World Time Attack, you're talking like to be a front running car in Time Attack these days, you've got to be making well over a thousand horsepower. Um, and the speeds, obviously, these days are, are certainly much, much, much higher. But um, but yeah, back then to to drive a car like at barely just over 260 kilometers an hour to just come down the front straight at Sydney Motorsport Park in a in a full body car and just hold it flat through turn one. There was no lift, no, and the thing would just stick like nothing else through there. It was just an unbelievable experience. And like we touched on before, obviously I've I've done very little in terms of open wheeler um, and not a lot in terms of cars with high downforce. Um, but certainly that that early days of Nemo in 2012. The only thing I can compare it to is that lap a few years later at Bathurst in the McLaren on sort of the, on the qualifying tyres where just the grip level was so high that it just, your brain doesn't believe that the car is capable of generating that much grip. So um, yeah, it was a great project to be involved in and, and very lucky to to be the driver of that car for sort of the two years and uh, and to stand on the podium in 2012. Unreal, mate. It just sounds like it's on steroids. Really cool. You talked about McElroy Racing, um, again, a, another very long chapter of your life in, involves this organisation. There have been some ups and downs in in that too. I mean, you talked about 2014 and the, the crash at Bathurst and going so close to winning the title in an epic battle with with um, with Richo. And I know Andy had to make that that tough call. I think there was another year on your 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 deal to keep racing there, and circumstantially things had changed for him with the business, and that that he couldn't go through with that. And yet you stayed. You remained immensely loyal. They are hugely proud of what you do with that, with that team now in a in a in a coaching sense, mate. And it's a, it's a huge credit to you the the part that you have played in their success. They're acutely aware of it. I want to talk about coaching because it more or less brings us back to the start of the podcast in that the driver training and things like that, the racing experience that you've had since then. It's almost as though it's brought all those facets together, and it's it's a natural thing for you. Did it did it come easily, and how did it start? Look, I think, like you said, like my journey in cars and driving started by being an instructor at Dad's driving school and being around some great guys, like we spoke about earlier, like the Rodney Cricks, the Mark Webbers, Greg McShane, obviously my dad, and there's been a whole bunch of other guys that were incredibly successful in their own rights in motorsport. And, and to learn and watch those guys, not only what they do as a driver, but what they do as a as a coach to be able to sort of help improve people's driving and everything like that. So before I was a race car driver, I was a driver trainer and and doing those sort of days. So the coaching side of it really does, I suppose, come relatively easy for me. And it's something that I take great pride in. And, and it's been a, a fantastic journey with the guys and girls at McElroy Racing. And it's a, it's a great opportunity that they've given me to – to sort of give back to the sport and to be able to sort of help those sort of young guys on on their path sort of through and to to share my experience and share sort of the things that I can sort of see them doing or 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 advice that I can give them to not only make them a better driver on track but also to be a better driver off track and how they engage with fans and sponsors and all that sort of stuff because the outside of the car is such a huge part of what we do. And a lot of the time that determines whether you actually get the opportunity to get into the car as well. So, um, yeah, like for me, it's a, it's been a, a great journey with uh, McElroy Racing. It started um, back in 2013, or actually started in 2012 with Nemo and then started in Carrera Cup in 2013 and 2014. Uh, and then we had another sort of uh, a half year in, in Carrera Cup in 2019. But my relationship with Andy actually goes back to – that first time I went to New Zealand and raced in the in the summer series of '95 and '96, I was that I was that young kid uh, racing at a one mate Peugeot series, and he was dominating the the Trans Am Championship, racing against Jim Richards, Dick Johnson, Steve Johnson, Peter Brock, uh, and he actually won the won the title that year. So um, so I've known Andy for a, a, a very very long time, um, and as I said, like he he and Mel and uh, are more like family to me these days, and um, yeah, I, I love the role that I have there, and. Uh, yeah, we've we've had success both with me as a driver, but also with the with the coaching of some of the young guys and girls that we've had come through as well. He is a great character. Um, he says that without even asking, and and um, they're just blown away that you do it. That you will often call some of those those drivers, those clients or customers, if you will, during the week, and just see how they're going in the lead up to a race meeting, after a race meeting. That that coaching extends beyond. Um, the the meeting proper, but can can we just zero in on a little story here to underscore 
the what I think, mate, without pumping your tyres, is is the world class level of what you do with this coaching, and it involves. I think it's Simon Ellingham is is the the driver in question here. He was at Queensland Raceway this particular day. He, I think, had only ever been around there in about a, a twelve, but over the radio while he is out on the track, you with with I'm imagining a, a very succinct very appropriately timed words that perhaps just come intuitively or naturally to you, you coach him to an 11.5, mate. <laughs> yeah, the, How do you do that? Look, there's been a few few of our guys over the years and probably sort of more of our sort of amateur guys where um, where their life has been all about business and everything like that and they're now in a position to, to go racing. It's my job as the coach is to be able to sort of help give them the confidence to push, I suppose, the car and themselves to a limit where they don't believe that they can ultimately go. So it's it's giving them that sort of reassuring voice in their ear to sort of push that little bit harder under brakes, to be that little bit more aggressive in the corner or whatever it is. But it's it's being able to find whatever the language is that you've got to use to work with each person because it's not just a case of you keep the same message for everyone. Everyone needs a different level of motivation or a different amount of sort of reassurance on the radio. Like some of the guys I speak to very little over the course of the race, whereas others like I'm on the radio flat out all the time sort of trying to encourage them, especially in the braking areas, to sort of to push that little bit deeper, to to find those marks that we've spoken about both in our track walk in our data and in our video sessions and everything like that of just giving them that confidence to push that a little bit deeper, to to dig deep within themselves because a lot of the time the the natural human reaction is you'll always be that little bit conservative. So you're trying to push them beyond their comfort zone without obviously going sort of too far. And, um, yeah, it's been, it's been a great journey and uh, I've worked with some great people al- along the way. Um, obviously, we've got guys like Matt Campbell and Jackson Evans that have uh, gone on to to go racing in Europe. And obviously, uh, uh, Matt's a, a Porsche contracted driver for the last few years. Jackson was uh, one of the Porsche juniors and still racing in Super Cup, um, WEC, and, and doing a whole bunch of stuff. So those guys have now really kind of continued the dream and and, and living. And they're both they're both living together over there with each other and uh, and now racing uh, in WEC together as well. Could you imagine those two as flatmates? That would be chaos. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done, well done. I, I, uh, it's a very unique skill, mate, and and um, you're to be admired for it. Can we finish with something that I think in our chat here is arguably the most important, and that is no second chance. I, I, I think this is something I'd like to spend a moment shining a light on to to conclude. And I would ask uh, listeners if you get a moment to Google it, to go to go and uh, have a look and a read to perhaps even consider um, trying to reach out and, and get this to your school, possibly even. So it involves you as one of a, a number of, of uh, very powerful speakers, mate, that drive home uh, and, 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 and illustrate the importance of good life choices, don't you? Yeah, so it's a it's a program that um, that Andy kind of launched uh, back in late 2012, 2013 in conjunction with uh, one of our speakers, Paul Stanley. So they'd known each other, um, grew up in the same part of uh, New Zealand. So um, Paul and Andy's dad were, were sort of good mates. And um, so Paul tragically lost his son in 2006 to um, a, a basically a one-punch coward attack. His son, uh, Matt, went to a party and um, there was an altercation. He went to go leave the party and a guy came up from behind, hit him from behind. Um, So it was kind of, uh, it it was something they'd sort of put together, but we realised that there needed to be a few more elements because our basic target audience is year year 11, but predominantly year 12 kids in, uh, in high school because in year 12, You've got kids that are getting to an age where they're starting to get their license. Um, and let's be honest, for, for most people, driving on the roads is literally going to be the most dangerous thing you'll do at any point in your life. But they're also at that age where they're starting to go to parties. There's there's alcohol, there's drugs, there's influences and everything like that. Um, so we we found another guy by the name of Matt Speakman. So Matt was a was an up-and-coming motorcycle racer in the early 90s. He just signed a contract with Honda uh, to race one of their bikes in the Australian Superbike Championship the following year. 
uh, was super excited. He worked at a nightclub in Sydney and his daily transport was a motorcycle. And at the end of the night, um, he and, uh, and a friend of his were on his bike sort of riding home um, and a drunk driver crossed the wrong side of the road and impacted both of them, um, threw them off the bike. Um, and Matt basically uh, recounts the story of that night from not only the, the phone call that day with Honda to ringing his parents in Tasmania to speaking of the how excited he was for that following year of basic, being that guy that was trying to live his dream in motorsport and obviously through bikes going to work that night and at the end of the night his friend, she came up to him and said, oh, look, someone's left a, a helmet in the cloakroom. Um, can you give me a lift? So made the decision to give her a lift on his bike, which put him on a on a path which he wouldn't have normally gone, um, to then riding along in the early hours of the morning and seeing these headlights come over the crest of a hill, ultimately be on the wrong side of the road and make impact with them and the feeling of leaving the bike, going over the roof of the car, and ultimately waking up in the gutter on the on the side of the road uh, with horrendous injuries and ultimately uh, injuries that has seen him in a wheelchair for the rest of his life. Um, but he talks about that night and the detail of the accident of waking up and the pain that he was in and, and feeling like basically from his chest down he had no movement. He couldn't feel his legs um, to then being transported to hospital um, and then the emotions of his family as to the phone call that they got to, hey, you need to try and get to Sydney to come and see your son because there's a good chance that he might not survive the surgery. But then talks about Maria, his friend that was on the bike, because her family got the the phone call that no family wants to be able to get, and that is you need to come down to the morgue to identify your daughter because she tragically was killed in the accident. So he talks the road safety angle of and his story is real because when they play his video and it shows highlights of his motorbike career and it finishes with photos of his x-rays and everything like that and he comes in in his wheelchair you can't not but pay attention because it's it's real it's not a it's not a police officer standing there saying you know what you shouldn't speed on the roads you shouldn't drink and drive this is a guy that is the direct result of someone else's actions and his life and his direction of life was forever changed through the stupidity of someone making the decision to get behind the wheel whilst under the influence of of alcohol. So he goes through that sort of story. And then, as I said, then Paul, he comes on and talks about the night of of the party that Matt, his son, went to where he was ultimately punched, where it was their other son's birthday. They've all gone for dinner. They went to the party to go drop um, his son, Matt, and his, um, his mates off to this party. They went home and he talks about getting that phone call that forever changed their life. And that was one of his son's friends on the phone saying, you need to get here. Matt's been punched. Some, some, something's happening. It's not good. So he's jumped in the car with his wife. They've um, gone there. He talks about what it was like to see his son laying on the side of the road with the ambulance office around him to then having to be in the ambulance to go to hospital and ultimately have to make that decision to turn the life support system off and to be that parent that turned the life support system off. Um, and, like, throughout both of their um, talks, you can you could literally hear a pin drop. And I suppose the, the most powerful message that these guys have is that this is real. This is not – it's not a parent. It's not a, it's not a teacher. These are people that have – lived the nightmare and continue to live this nightmare to this very day. They will always, uh, Paul will never be able to wake up and hug his son Matt again. Um, uh, so it's just, it's that, it's that realisation that these things actually happen and the kids that we're talking to, they're of that age. But then what we finish with is I come in and I talk about, I suppose, what it is like to actually live your dream, to make smart decisions in life that, I was a kid that sat there on the lounge with my dad and watched motorsport. I was a seven-year-old kid that watched Bathurst and dreamt of being a race car driver. Now, at that age, I had no idea what it would mean or what sacrifices I would have to make or how much effort would be required to get there. But still to this day, I'm that kid living the dream. So my message to them is very, very simple. Make smart decisions. You can live your dreams. It doesn't matter what your dream is, whether it be sporting, academic, in music, or whatever it is that you want to do in life, with hard work, you can achieve what seems to be the unachievable, but you've got to be willing to work hard at it. No one's just going to, 
hand it over to you. No one was just going to give me a Bathurst drive. No one's just going to sort of hand over those sort of opportunities to me. I've had to work hard to get those opportunities to be where I am today. So it's a great mix of the three of us because you've got those two guys where their messages are so powerful and so it really cuts down to the core of what these kids are, where they're at in life. As I said, they're at that age where they're going to parties. There is alcohol. There is drugs. There's they're getting their licenses and we've seen it um, in the road statistics, that 17 to 25-year-old age group, they are the most at-risk drivers on our roads. They make up the highest percentage of our fatality rate. So there's there's messages in everything that we sort of talk about um, in, in the hour that we're, we're there. But the interesting thing is in the time that we've done it, We've been to every type of school from sort of your most elite of private schools to we've been to the Townsville Youth Detention Centre where there are kids that are obviously have fallen foul of the law and they are now in the in the detention system and everything like that. But the message that we or the the feedback we get from the teachers right across the board is one of like we've never seen something work so well. Um, even kids that are in, in the detention centre, like, they don't talk, they don't muck up, they sit there and they listen intently for the whole hour that we've been there. And, and that's the one thing that so many of the teachers that we go to say, that we've never seen the kids, we can't even get them to to sit this still for this long in a normal class. So we know that the message is, is getting through and it's it's about being able to make a difference. Well done, mate. It's absolutely powerful stuff, but I love as difficult as it must be for them to recount some of those stories, I love the real world cut through at an important age for for those school kids. Um, I think, mate, that is a, a perfect way for us to to wrap things up. Massive congratulations on on what you've done for being that that kid that grew up around it with dreams of being at Bathurst, co-driving and being with some of the biggest race teams in the country. Um, having some unbelievable drives of all kinds of different cars along the way and still doing it in a in a racing sense. The stunt driving, I love no second chance and the coaching too, mate. And we wish you all the, the very best. Most importantly, could I just say well done too? Because I know more than anything, you're a proud dad. So well done. Definitely. Thanks, mate. I think uh, out of everything, that's definitely uh, that's definitely my biggest achievement and uh, and the thing I'm most proud of. It's, uh, you know, what it's like being a dad. I've got a, a great little girl there and, um, and just to see her sort of growing up and, uh, yeah, she's definitely... Definitely, uh, definitely a, a, an amazing part of my life and uh, a lot of fun. Great stuff. Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series producer and editor is Alex Mitchell. Audio production by Darcy Thompson. Listener.